Good afternoon. My name is Mpilo Ntlem Tunzi, and I'll be giving a presentation on the bioethical principle of autonomy as it relates to mental health. Just to give you a brief rundown of how my presentation is going to be structured. My presentation will set off by giving an introduction, followed by the definition of key terms, which are going to be alluded to, or alluded to throughout the course of the presentation. I'll also give a literature review, uh, followed by a critical analysis, uh, and then a discussion, uh, after which I will have uh, concluding remarks and recommendations to the topic. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll give a list of references of the authors that would have been alluded to during the course of the presentation. Ethics and psychiatry have been a focus since the Nazi Germany era um, when doctors committed atrocities to patients, uh, including those that suffer from mental illness. Buchum and Childress uh, define autonomy as the ability to make decisions intentionally and with substantial understanding and freedom from controlling influences. Owen says, unless one is a child or a person who harms others or a person with a mental disorder, freedom from others' interference is a fundamental right. However, in order for one to practice uh, this right to autonomy, they have to be seen to be competent. And competence itself uh, is defined as the ability to perform a task relative to the decision to be made. Just to give a brief history of the principle of autonomy itself, Autonomy derives from the Greek word autos, which means self, and nomos, which means rule, governance, or law. Autonomous, therefore, means self-rule or self-governance. The idea of autonomy was first clearly articulated in the International Code of Medical Ethics, adopted in 1949. Pelto Perry et al. say that it can be traced back to as far as World War II. Now, the history of the principle as it relates to psychiatry. Uh, in 1997, the World Psychiatric Association met and passed the Hawaii Declaration followed by the Declaration of Madrid, which is now the overarching international standard of psychiatric ethics. This is according to Easterbrook. According to Lafani and Prieb, uh, consumerism and postmodern cultural changes have also had an impact on how autonomy as it relates to psychiatry has evolved. In order for uh, a patient to be seen to be exercising their right to autonomy fully, there are requirements that have to be made, that are to be met. The patient has to be competent or have capacity and have to be free from external constraints. In addition, they have to be offered options and be enabled to make informed decisions. Since this principle, uh, since this discussion relates to uh, autonomy vis-a-vis -vis mental illness, it is important that uh, mental illness is itself defined. Mental illness is a disturbance in thoughts and emotions that decreases a person's capacity to cope with the challenges of everyday life. And that's according to Bolton. So autonomy as it, 
as it relates to mental illness then, it, it can be seen that by virtue of an illness, that by its definition affects one's capacity for logic, reason, reality testing, and perception of self vis-a-vis -vis the world, the right to autonomy is and can be restricted. Because uh, autonomy, uh, because mental illness uh, affects the cognitive ability, this has implications on one's need to self-determine. Uh, For mental health patients, the right to autonomy can be overruled uh, by competing moral principles or respect for the safety of others and the patients. In other words, the right to autonomy is not absolute. Easterbrook argues that placing emphasis on autonomy where capacity has been diminished as a result of uh, mental illness might actually result in more harm than good. And this is also reinforced by Pelto Perry et al. Risk management justifies legislative uh, mechanisms in overriding a person's refusal to accept uh, admission to hospital or indeed treatment for a mental disorder. As with regard to uh, policy and legislation, in 2008, Australia ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. The national standards for mental health services accentuated more uh, accentuated the move towards putting the interests of patients and their carers first. In addition, the Madrid and the COVE declaration issued by the World Psychiatric Association underscored the respect for patients and promoted the shared value of shared uh, decision making. The Victorian Mental Health Act is another legislative framework um, that enshrined all these principles into law. Despite all this, though, uh, a certain degree of paternalism is inevitable in mental health, which, which might seem to be contradictory to the principle of autonomy. However, uh, Pelto Perry et al. say that where the patient's autonomy is impaired, a plan must be put in place on how to restore it uh, to enable him or her to be a partner in decision making. It's important to notice that autonomy, um, uh, that cultural norms do interfere with the right to practice uh, the principle of autonomy. According to Free Garden Eisted, different cultures view autonomy differently. And this has to be taken into account in psychiatry as well. In psychiatry, where patients are treated against their will, um, it is important that uh, a lot of patients can still be offered some degree of autonomous choice in their treatment plan. Thus, uh, in psychiatry, while many patients are incapacitated by illness to exercise full autonomy, it should be respected to the greatest extent possible, and that's by Easterbrook. In fact, studies show that uh, giving patients autonomy increases engagement, although not so for the severely uh, mentally ill. That's according to Dwight John et al. So as a form of discussion then, we have seen that uh, in psychiatry, some patients are treated against their will, although most are actually voluntary. Some patients lack the capacity to self-govern, and therefore it would be folly to uh, assume that they can exercise the right to autonomy. In some cases, in those cases, paternalism is inevitable. However, it's important to note that a uh, degree of illness should inform the clinician's level of paternalism. To conclude, for mental health patients, as indeed with other people, autonomy is not absolute. Some degree of paternalism is still inherent in psychiatry and in some cases still needed. 
Culture and societal values determine the weight each ethical principle is given, especially as it relates to the principle of autonomy. As recommendations, the balance of responsibility for decision making in the therapeutic relationship needs to be uh, needs to have a dynamic flexibility, taking into account the patient's current condition and considering the patient's experience. Staff training is also a useful undertaking in this area. Effective information delivery to enable informed choices should be at the core of a clinician's practice when championing the patient's autonomy. And cultural norms should, as always, be taken into account when considering the principle of autonomy. That was my presentation on how mental health uh, interacts with the principle of uh, autonomy. Thank you.